Before I get into our study of the morning, I must relate to you how I came to uh, decide to preach this sermon. And Trish doesn't have to be embarrassed over this because the people here know that uh, I change sometimes rather quickly when it comes to uh, sermons. Now she's going to wonder what in the world I'm talking about, but she'll find out in a minute. Some of you know that yesterday was my birthday, hit the big 66, but I've never really grown up or anything else, anybody taking on much about birthdays around my house. I think yesterday probably was uh, probably the biggest thing I had in a long time as far as a birthday. Trish being the, I call, you know, she's a daughter-in-law, but really she's just another daughter. She wished me a happy birthday. She did it on Facebook. Now, Facebook just doesn't go but to a few people. What she doesn't know, I told her a little bit last night, is that when I got on Facebook, I would have expected almost every senator in Washington to write me from all of the people that wrote. And some of them are my preaching brethren. Now, that ought to cause some of you to say, oh, because preaching brethren that are my friends, and I must say I do the same thing with them, they begin to send all sorts of nice things especially when you're getting a little older. So here came, not only on Facebook, but on even one chat list, uh, I became the subject. Ridicule is all it was. <laughs> and then I received personal emails. Of course, all of them were saying, how wonderful it is that you had a birthday today and you hit 66, and that was the nice part. Then they tacked other things on the bottom of it. I frankly lost count. I did find out this. As soon as she put that on there, evidently that's all they were doing was sitting and looking at their computers because it came in like a flood. So I'm trying to answer these things on Facebook and emails, at least trying to say thank you, and then with some of them deliver back barbs they deserved. <laughs> well, I wrote one. Because Rolf Rofner wasn't happy enough to give me only one, he decided to send me two, a little far apart, and both of them were, um, well, we won't even go into what they were saying about my age. So I wrote a response to Roth. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and this is the reason it's dangerous to be on Facebook when whatever it is you write, you put out there. Now, all she did was real nice, sent me a very nice congratulations on my birthday. But I answered Rolf, but I and I don't remember doing this at all, but I got it on her timeline. So she's receiving a pretty good answer that was all right, part of it. The rest of it was answering him and the barbs he had delivered to me. So when they got to the house last night, they were kind of being, uh, what's wrong with him? Because I got into what's going to be some passages here in James 4 about life's as a vapor, and at my age... Um, I'm just about to be vaporized, and so she uh, she was telling Timothy, maybe, what was it you said you're going to stop and get some sort of... She's willing to make a tombstone out of it for you. So that's how much it's better, because she couldn't figure out, I'm answering somebody else, and all she said was happy birthday, and she got this sermon back, and it took me even a little while to realize when she was telling me this, which one of those I'd written, because I could I couldn't remember it. And I thought, well, I don't remember writing that back to her. And then I finally realized what had happened. And, uh, of course, you know, she's already said, as others did, maybe it was uh, older timer's disease. Not old time or all time, older timer's disease. Anyway, all that happened, and I thought, hmm. So after they all went to bed last night, I redid a sermon. And... Uh, it's not a light thing. It's something that I think fits well where we are at the end of this year. You know, as far as the days go by, it's just another day today and then next week. But a new year begins Tuesday. And so people always take opportunities to talk about things as they relate to the end of the old year or the beginning of the new year. So I thought, well, I, I'm, I'm going to do something on this. And they were laughing at me so much about, well, you know, he's, he's going to be dead tomorrow. It sounds like he's pretty morose and depressed and down in the dumps. So I decided to preach on 
Live like you were dying. Live like you were dying. And I chose as my text, James chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. So when they had already, as I said properly, not hit the sack, but they had retired for the evening last night, I sat down and, and I didn't use a computer. I just went back to the old yellow sheet and penciled some things down here for this morning. I think it's been attributed to the great baseball philosopher Yogi Berra that when you come to the fork in the road, take it. Now, you know, you have to let that say, philosophical things get rather deep. You have to think about that for a while. But there are, there is a, a proper way to say you reach the fork in the road by meaning you have to make a decision. Go one way or the other. It's obvious you can't go on both of them at the same time. So you have to make your mind up. I'm going to go to the left or the right. And what all is going on in your mind as to the kind of fork in the road that it is will determine what you're going to do. Now, there is another choice. You could turn around in some situations and go back. Or you could stop right there and not go back or forward. But in life, that's really an impossibility. And... Birthdays just keep coming around. And when they stop coming around, then that means you have really made a transition into eternity. So the big question is, when it comes down to our lives, is what Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve, but it's for me and my house we will serve the Lord. So life is full of choices. You cannot escape that. I would say that to our young people, to our old people, to anything in between and to everybody. You have to make decisions, and you surely want to make the best decision on whatever the situation is. So when it comes to living life, you need to choose the fork that leads to God and keeps you on the right path. And that means a different concept of yourself and your life here on earth from the person who cares not about God and who lives strictly for the here and now as if it's always going to be the way it is with us right now. But it's not. Because you see, we're dying every day. All day long, we're dying. The youngest of us, we're dying. The oldest of us, we're dying. It's just a matter of when the biological functions of this body get to a point where it can't function anymore and the spirit departs. As James says, uh, the spirit apart from the body is dead. And that's as good a definition of death as anybody can come up with, seeing that death means separation. So when the body cannot function anymore as God made it, then the spirit departs, and that's death. So I need to ask the question, knowing that faith comes by hearing the word of God. My trust in God's based upon what he tells me in his word, which, of course, implies study of it the great desire to know it. And when it comes then to life, what am I doing with my life? And we're all at different positions, different places on the road of life. So the question I really need to ask is how does real biblical faith, confidence, trust in God based upon His Word, Romans 10 verse 7, how does it work? How does it work? And real faith will not let you live an ignorant life. Ignorant means simply the absence of knowledge. All of us in some areas are ignorant. But when it comes to what must I do to be saved from my sins and live a life that will end up in heaven with God and escape damnation of the devil's hell for people who die guilty of their sins, that gets rather important. About as important as anything I can think of. Now, in verse 14, and let's pause before I go to that. We'll go to it in just a minute. Let's keep in mind that James is one of those epistles or letters called, uh, that section fits in that section of the New Testament called the general epistles. It's not addressed specifically to a church. But if you look at it, you will see that it is addressed to Jewish Christians. And they're scattered. They're not in any one particular point, even as the book of Hebrews and Jude is addressed to them. So he's not writing to people outside the church who need to be converted to Christ. He's writing to members of the church. He's writing to Christians. This begins to tell me of some of the pitfalls we 
as Christians can get into because he addresses members of the church regarding what they need to do. And we look at verse 13, chapter 4 of James. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Now, if you don't watch out, you will think, well, God is not at all happy with people who make plans to go to certain places in their secular work and make money. That's not what he's talking about at all. It has nothing to do with it. Remember, you come to Fortner Road, you've got to go one way or the other if you're going to continue to go forward. What he's doing, this man addressed, are people like this. Are doing all of this, making their plans, purposing, getting ready for whatever, but they're not including God in any of it. Now remember, these are members of the church. It's almost like the businessman who says, cheat somebody out of something in a business deal, and somebody says, don't you know that you cheated him, you lied to him? And he said, well, that's just good business. That's just business. It's almost like these folks right here are saying, well, we're Christians, members of the church, we're headed for heaven. But we'll make our plans on our jobs and whatever else, but we won't take into consideration what God said about things like that. Well, that's not what's, what we ought to be doing. So the problem is not that this man was making plans. Well, let me emphasize it again. He was doing it without God. And that's where most people are all the time. You think about your life and you think about what you're planning to do tomorrow or on January 1st. And so many times you're not saying what he says ought to be ever on the faithful child of God's mind if the Lord will. Now that, that is simply meaning I take God's will into consideration and whatever it is I plan on doing. And that, listen, the earlier in life that you learn that and begin to practice it, the better off everybody's going to be if you expect heaven to be your home and to keep yourself out of a whole lot of problems. You find most people, when they're young, they'll talk about, well, what have we got? High school, I'm going to go to this or that, further education of some sort. And very rarely, and it's a shame, do you hear people saying, well, I want to choose this route because it will help me be a better servant of the Lord and it won't obligate me so much to this present world, but will give me freedom to be more active in the work of the church. When have you heard that from a member of the church? You don't. And that's because we have this written to Christians right here. It's written to us, telling us how we ought to think. You see, I don't know what's going to happen, even in the next few seconds. I have no idea of what's going to happen, and certainly not this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow. I have no idea about it. And, and, and the Old Testament addressed this. Remember that book of Proverbs, a book of P-I-T-H-Y, pithy sayings, much wisdom, fundamental common sense wisdom. So James didn't write to these Jewish Christians who certainly knew their Old Testament, something they had not been exposed to. Because Proverbs 27.1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. That's basically the same thing. See, the word boast comes out here. Boast comes from somebody that says, Now, boy, you've got me. You don't need anybody else. I can take care of it, whether you can or you can. Pride is entered in. So, we must, and this is our first point, be enlightened, not be ignorant. Faith won't let us be ignorant when it comes to what we do with our life and making our choices. Can you think of anything better to renew in your mind than that point, day in and day out, not just at the end of a year or the beginning of another? We must take God into consideration on these very practical matters of mundane things that we do that every other human does in the flesh in this world. But most people don't. Well, we got all this big business of this pitfall of the United States that's all up there and everybody's going to fall off and whatever. And you know, everybody's griping. Look what that's all about. Money, 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 and money, money, money. Okay, fine. If the world ends tomorrow, you'll see there's a greater pitfall that people aren't prepared for than what's going to happen if the people can't get together in Washington and decide what they're going to do. But here's the point I wanted to make. I wonder how many of them are trying to include God 
and what they're trying to agree on up there. Do you really believe that they're saying, well, now wait. Let's sit down here, and before we start discussing all of this, let's understand why God set up nations in the first place, and let's uh, understand what we're to do in, in the responsibility that we have to this nation, and let's pray about it. Can you imagine some of those people praying? Let's pray about it, and let's be dependent upon the enlightening truth of God's Word. Remember, faith won't let you be ignorant. And let's determine what we're going to do and approach things in that standpoint. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So these people, and so many times with us too, because remember, this was written to Christians. The next point I want to make, faith, as I said, number one, will not let you live ignorantly. But it won't let you live arrogantly either. I cover the ground I stand on. I actually heard a man who claimed to be an elder who got upset at somebody else and the, and the feelings were getting pretty hot right there and he bowed up at him and it looked like they were going to come to blows. He said, I'll cover the ground I stand on. I thought, <laughs> what? There's nothing about these people that says God's taken in consideration on what's going on. Well, you simply won't live arrogantly with God. The very idea of being humble, meek, Submissive to his will. He knows the way. I don't. I've got to listen to somebody else. But there's a host of people in this world who are not going to do that. And yet we don't know what's going to be in the next second. And we're so proud. We, we, I mean, look at all the great things we've accomplished in science, architecture, all kinds of things in medicine. And we're just pretty proud of ourselves. So we come up with a doctrine like humanism. And humanism says there is no God. Whatever we are, we're the measure of it. And if we get any better, it'll be up to man to do it. Uh, we are the ones. And we need to look to ourselves for all the, the benefit. We don't know what in the world. Those people say that. They don't know what's going to be next. You don't know where, what you're going to be involved in. Time goes on. Even trying to get home today. Some sort of traffic jam, or maybe a runaway blood clot just starting to jar loose right now, and that's the end of it in a little while. You don't know. And that's, that's what's being brought out here. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I know as well as anybody improvements I need to make in my life and what I strive to do day in and day out. But I also know, and I, I didn't realize when it happened that it was as important as it was, but I knew it ought to be, that one of, and as an older person, I look back and know what it was, and that is, as a, as a teenager, I made up my mind that God's going to come first. I don't care what happens to anybody else. And so I lost lots of friends by my own choice because they didn't have that attitude. And on and on, they go, but I, I've been so happy that I was willing, and again, I'm not bragging. I know where in my weaknesses are, and if I don't see them as well as all two, Joe, you can help me. Uh, the point is, is that a Christian has confidence. But it's confidence in God and the Word of God. It's not confidence in himself. The problem with a whole lot of us is pride. I see it every day. And we can't admit we are ignorant. We can't admit we're weak. We can't admit that we need somebody else. And especially we can't admit that we need God. People can get so swelled up and puffed up. It even affects families. There's a story told about a husband who was a businessman. And very involved in the company and a pretty important job. And he, he had a, a client that he had to see in another city. So he was going to have to rise early like 5 o'clock in the morning. Some of you will identify with this and be at the airport at the red-eye flight and catch it so they could be there in time for the appointment. And he normally did not have to get up that early. Well, he and his wife uh, weren't speaking. So he wrote her a note saying, Honey... Please wake me up when you get up. Because she had to get up earlier to go to work. Wake me up when you get up. I don't want to miss this flight. Well, he awakened. 
at 9 o'clock the next morning. Of course, he'd missed his flight. He was up in the air. He was so mad he couldn't see straight. And as he looked, stomping around his bedroom, there on the bedside table was a note. And it read, Honey, it's 5 o'clock. You need to get up. <laughs> Pride can cause all sorts of things to happen to you. Pride can get you into things that's so childish. It's ridiculous. All because we can do it ourselves. And I've used this many times before. That's what Frank Sinatra was so great on in the song, I Did It My Way. You will not go to heaven your way. Or my way, or any other human's way. You'll go to heaven on the God's way, on the basis of what the Word of God teaches you, is the way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It's the reason the gospel is God's plan of salvation, or is God's power to save, Romans 1.16. Here's a point you ought to remember. Pride may get you what you think you ought to have. Pride may get you what you think you ought to have. But it will keep you from what God knows you need and will give you. And that's about as true as anything I know I could say to anybody this morning. And will help you in making any decisions as the other points here I trust will in the coming year. As this year dies and it will help you from day to day. Pride may get you what you think you ought to have, but it will keep you from what God will give you. God knows a way to heaven. I don't. That's the reason gospel preachers have to preach the gospel. It's always amazed me that these preachers, <laughs> they're called gospel preachers. They're called ministers of the word. And when you hear them preach, you hear everything but the word. Well, whatever we do, it ought to be drawing people back to God's Word, the importance of it, the authority of it, that it's the only guide from earth to heaven. And when you leave it, you're going to go somewhere else. Well, where are you going to go? And the last point is, faith will cause you to live dependently. Now, now our points are faith will not let you live ignorantly. Faith will not let you live arrogantly, full of pride, doing it your way, not humbling yourself to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. James said that too earlier in the book. And faith will cause you to live dependently. We in the church, we're Christians, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Through obedience to the gospel, our Lord adding us to the church or our brothers and sisters who were there before us through obedience to the gospel. We're baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. Acts 2.38, Galatians 3.27. We have enjoyed a new birth. We've been converted. We've changed our whole outlook on life. All of our plans are changed. Because we now plan above all things to know the will of God and to do it. God will not be left out of our lives. Part of repentance is simply saying, well, I may have left him out a lot. He may have been totally left out, but not anymore. Everything about me is going to depend on God. The quicker you can come to that conclusion in life, the better you'll be. Because as a young person, when you do that, you'll start arranging your life different than what you will when you're not dependent, but and this is what the devil knows well as anybody. Young people want their independence. At a time when they need to be more dependent is when Satan says, I'll cause them to want their independence. Well, it may be independent from a lot of things pertaining to this world, but you never get independent from God. You become more dependent upon God. And that's the thing that a lot of us don't know. One of the things that we need to realize is that Satan catches us so much in the sins of omission. For some reason, we just don't see omitting a responsibility as being as terrible and evil as when we violate a commandment. We commit a sin of commission.
commit commission. Some reason we haven't got that in our head yet. We still measure things by, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this, and every one of those things we shouldn't do. But then what, what takes their place? And there's the problem. What are we doing for the Lord? We need to depend on Him and let Him show us in His Word what we now as converted people are doing as members of His spiritual body, the church. Look at verses 15 through 17 in James. And we'll see, I think, uh, the point I want to make, the last point that I intend to make, and I hope it will bear on your mind closely with the other two points. For, what, for that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. That doesn't show dependence on God. I don't know what would. But he says of them, now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Again, the pride stands out that you can do it your way. But then here's the biggie. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it's sin. Sin of omission. So we have responsibilities that are peculiar to us as members of the church that nobody else has laid upon us by the New Testament of Christ. That's, that we do. We must do. We let them drift. We just let them drift. Yet Paul would have, tells us, through writing to Timothy, that... He would have all men, God would, would have all men to be saved. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, Who shall have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. What is the will of heaven concerning man's salvation? He wants all men to be saved. But Jesus taught in John 8, 31 and 32, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. Well, notice, God will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. But it's the church that is taught to teach the truth. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Into our hands, as the song says, the gospel is given. And so are we looking for ways in this very brief life that's a vapor and we're all getting closer every day to vaporizing? It's going to end. Are we really keeping in mind that God would have all men be saved just like you're saved or I'm saved if you are a Christian and if you're faithful to God? Every life on this planet is in the hands of God. And yet because He created us free moral agents, we have free will. Even though He wants us to be saved, He will not work against that will. We have to choose. We're back where we started. Fork of the road. We have to choose. Today, as this sermon closes, you have to choose. We'll sing a song designed to encourage you to think about your life before God now. Designed to make you choose to become a Christian or not, if you're not a Christian. Or if there's sin in your life as a child of God, to repent of that sin or not. That's what you will do. I don't know your heart. God does. He knows you through and through as He does all men. What keeps us alive is that God wills we remain alive. The Lord's not slack concerning His promise. That's the Lord's promise to return. But He's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. We are dependent on God for all things. But people won't acknowledge that. But the faith that is built on the Bible, the confidence in God, the trust in God... It readily acknowledges that. These people who were Christians and that James addressed had, had missed that a whole lot. There's something about us as humans in the flesh that we begin to live. We just think, well, it'll always be that. Oh, we tell ourselves we're dying. The atheist knows he's going to die. But it's a totally different thing. There's a failure then on our part many times to do right. But if we have the faith, the Bible says we're interested in those sins of omission. We're interested in our responsibility. We want to make the choice to view, review our lives. And if there are things we're leaving undone, we ought to do. It's obligatory. Then we ought to decide to change that. And we ought to do it. Let me ask you this. Some of us fly. Some fly more than others. And you hear a lot about air traffic control. And that's very important if you're a commercial flyer. Very important. Now, let's say you're flying to New York or you're flying to California. You're going to leave Houston. And you're listening to the pilot and co-pilot talk. 
And there you're going to be piloting your plane. And one says to the other, <clears throat> hey, let's have something new. It gets pretty dull on these trips. Let's have something new. We're pilots. We've been trained. We've got years of experience and knowledge. They keep us trained right up on the right level of things. Let's put a little spice in this trip and let's leave Houston and fly to wherever it is in California and let's not pay a bit of attention to the air traffic control. Would you get on the plane? People live their lives every day and they don't pay attention to air traffic control. But a pilot would, would say, you're crazy. If you expect me to go fly this plane commercially, leaving Houston and flying to Los Angeles, New York, or wherever it may be, because they control everything about what that plane does. From the time it backs away from the gate to where it's going to go on the runway to its place in line to as it goes up in the air, where it positions itself in the air, when it goes up or down, when it's ready to land, everything is done by air traffic control and nobody turns up and says, well, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm tired of listening to them. I can do this myself. No, you see, they got to have a lot of faith, a lot of trust in air traffic control. So people understand that they have to do that in everyday life, but they don't understand it when it comes to spiritual matters. Well, we need to. Because... Our life's out of vapor. And it appears for a little while and then vanishes the way. We have so limited time to get ready to meet our Maker. And while life may at times seem like it's very long, I have found it since a teenager when I got my eyes open and learned a little sense. That's been the choices I've tried to make. And I've done my best to preach to others to do the same thing. And I've never regretted those choices. I'm just very sorry others didn't didn't make them, didn't learn. They chose this life. They chose how to make most money, position in life. Left God out of it. And you see the attitude of God. And these were not people outside of Christ. These were Christians that were making that serious mistake. And if that was needful for them then, it's needful for us as Christians today. Because it's so easy. We build our house. We buy our car. We plan what we're going to do in retirement. We this, we that. Oh, that's this world. And it can be taken away in a snap of the finger. And it will be someday. You just don't know when. You know where our problem is? Then the lesson's yours. Now notice I said that. Then the lesson's yours. These folks over here say when I say that, I'm going to be preaching a lot longer. But then the lesson's yours. Sonia's not here today because I usually pick on her. It just simply comes down to what we see in life. What we see in life. Do we see things in the flesh and from that perspective? We sang a song, Jeff, I know you'll sing it. Couldn't have done a better job as far as what I'm wanting to do right now. Camping. You know what's wrong with a whole lot of us? We're pilgrims. That means we're just passing through. We fall in love with the campground. And we've tried to put down roots. And really, we ought to be just having something that's easy to pack up and move on. Nothing in this life is solid and abiding. Even this will pass away. If you don't have that attitude, you're in for some sore, bad decision-making. Because you're going to make choices on the basis of the flesh and security here. And it's not going to work. Your choices are take up your cross and follow Christ. You're just traveling through. And an atheist? Well, he's just traveling through too. He just thinks when he dies, he's going to be like a little dog rover, dead all over. But he's traveling through too. But we are enlightened by the good word of God. Know that it's appointed unto men once to die. But it doesn't end there. Hebrews 9.27, but after that, the judgment. So, what about our faith? What about our faith? Are you a Christian? Are you faithful as a Christian? Faith won't let you live ignorantly. It won't let you live arrogantly. <clears throat> and it's going to cause you to see your responsibility and not commit these sins of omission. It'll cause you to live dependently, depending on God for all that you are and all that you have 
and all your associations. I guess I ought to say thank you, Trish. I might not have thought of those things. I'm sorry I answered you with the wrong answer. <laughs> I don't know that Rolf has it yet. We thank you for being here on this last Lord's Day of this old year. Where we'll be this time next week, I don't know. But if we're dependent on God according to his word, we'll be in the right place because he will take care of all of us. If you need to obey the gospel, we've studied about what it takes to become a Christian. As a child of God, are you living faithful? Don't be filled with pride. Break that old pride down and say, Lord, I'm coming home. And do what you need to do as the Bible teaches to become a Christian or to, once again, be faithful as a child of God. If you're subject then to his call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.